This podcast is produced by The Business Times in partnership with Standard Chartered and Tomasic for EcoSparity. Hi everyone, my name is Keith from Tomasic with our sustainability and public affairs team. And I'm very happy today to be holding an EcoSparity conversation in partnership with Standard Chartered to really speak about supporting climate innovation and all the solutions to accelerate our collective net zero outcomes. Joining me today is Dr. Steve Howard, our Vice Chairman for Sustainability, and Marisa Drew, Chief Sustainability Officer for Standard Chartered. Steve, introduce yourself just a little bit and then we'll pass it on to Marisa. Yeah, I'm a a lifelong sustainability guy. I'm a scientist by first training, a PhD in environmental physics, and then I've led sustainability for IKEA. And I've been delighted the last three years to be uh, helping lead sustainability in, in Tamasek. I came into sustainability from a very traditional career in investment banking and capital markets in the recognition that if we can marry our ambitions to try to deliver a positive impact with a financial imperative, we create a sustainable model for the financial services industry. I've been in this field since 2017, and I've recently joined Standard Chartered Bank as the inaugural Chief Sustainability Officer. We are here in Singapore hosting the inaugural of Short Week where Standard Chartered is supporting the Earthshot Prize as a founding partner and Tomasic as a strategic partner. And so we're really here to talk about climate innovation and solutions. Marissa, Standchart, the only bank amongst the Earthshot founding partners, could you share a little bit more about what the Earthshot Prize means to Standard Chartered? The reason that we got involved is that that it's so mission aligned. I believe that if we're going to make a positive and really differential impact on the world, we've got to have very ambitious goals. And that's something that is at the heart of Earthshot Prize. It's ambition and it's a desire to scale these innovative solutions. So very much in the DNA of uh, what we're all about at Standard Chartered. This is the first year that Earthshot Prize is coming to Singapore, which is one of our home markets. I think there's a recognition that we need to bring the developing economies into the equation in a very robust way by really inciting the next generation to participate in this equation. And our markets are so disproportionately affected by climate change that uh, their response really matters. Steve, you know, Tomasic, you know, we have set our climate commitments, reducing our net carbon emissions attributable to our portfolio to half of our 2010 levels by 2030 and looking to achieve net zero by 2050. And these are pretty ambitious targets given the size of Tomasic's portfolio. Can you share how discovering and scaling innovative climate solutions could help to move the needle on this very, very ambitious goal? And are there any particular challenges, opportunities that you think are really top of mind? With the climate challenge, we need deep, deep decarbonisation at pace and at scale. And maybe 70% of the solutions we've already got, solar power, wind power, electric batteries for vehicles, etc. So a big part of the challenge is deploying those at incredible scale. So there's a target that will be issued at COP this year to triple renewable energy globally. And that's so we've all of human history to do the quarter we've got so far, three quarters to come in between now and 2030. So incredible pace. We need to focus on that. But innovation is all about improving on that and the remaining 30%. And it's areas where there are more challenges. Circular economy is one. So the world is still locked into a extract, make, use, throw away economy. It's a linear economy. And we need to get into the circular economy where we're recycling, reusing, remanufacturing things. So the companies like Cirque, which is an Earthshot Prize nominee for this year, Cirque is a fantastic example of that because they're looking at how do you actually take textiles where you've got polyester mixed with cotton and then you can actually recycle the cotton without damaging it and use those fibers again and again and again. Those are the things we want to do because the world's moved into a fast fashion economy. Yes, we need more durable clothes that we use more than once or twice, but we also need to be at the end of our life, be able to repurpose them and remanufacture them. Built environment is also an area where we're making, I would say, limited progress. And whether that's the concrete in the buildings, the steel used. So novel techniques that are coming through for low carbon cement, for green steel, these are the things where we're going to need the innovation and we're going to need to scale it fast. We own an airline, Singapore Airlines. So obviously we've worked with them to have a much more efficient fleet, but that only takes you 25% of where you want to go. And over time, emissions will still go up. So we've got to move towards sustainable aviation fuel. So innovations, I think, are a crucial part of this. But so is focusing on deep decarbonisation now. 
Steve, a lot of what you talked about, some of the sectors, hard to beat sectors like aviation, the built environment, these are tremendous challenges that require systems level change. How would we even think about catalyzing momentum in order for us to be able to unlock some of those outcomes? And from Tomasic, or from an investment perspective, where would you even start to think about financing such innovations and solutions? Innovation isn't just a technology challenge. So we need public policymakers to be innovative people in procurement to be innovative. You need policy frameworks that put prices on carbon, that create incentives for good solutions. And then you need business innovation and investment alongside that. We all need that innovation and disruptive change mindset. As an investor, you've got to have a thesis. So we're a trend aligned investor where we look at climate change and sustainability as a mega trend that will shape all of our lives and beyond long into the future. You have to know that the world is going to go to a net zero world, hopefully by 2050, but the direction is nearly inevitable. So we're going for solutions that are breathtakingly efficient, that are based on clean energy, that use nature as a platform, that are fully circular. So as an investor, getting deep into that mindset and then mapping all of the technology developers out there, really understanding what can work and where the market's going. And it's super exciting because it's not just about financial returns. It's about people and the planet at the same time. Marisa, what are you seeing your clients deal with in terms of the challenges and the opportunities? And how are you helping your clients really be able to transition and path their way to net zero? Well, before I answer that question, it's a wonderful segue from some of the points that Steve raised, which is oftentimes when we think of innovation in the climate equation, we think of deep tech or technological breakthrough solutions. But there's also business model innovation, sometimes very simple solutions applied in a different way. For instance, seaweed farming is one of the finalists this year. Now, seaweed farming as a concept isn't deep tech, but the application of the use of seaweed in something like animal feed, which can reduce methane emissions in a pretty material way in the beef industry is a massive differentiator potentially in terms of climate change mitigation. We are a very large trade bank, so we help the movement of capital from east to west and vice versa. And oftentimes, when you think about the end of a supply chain, the large global buyers of goods and services, they want to know if they're going to deliver on their own net zero commitments, which are very complicated if you're in a very long supply chain. You want to know that all of the various players along that value chain are employing sustainable practices very difficult thing to do when you're talking about four or five levels down. Those are the sorts of innovations that we're participating in helping our clients think through this, sustainable supply chain finance. And that helps to uplift small and medium enterprises when we share with them what are best practices that will allow them to participate in the global economy going forward that is one that, as Steve talks about, is truly a sustainable economy. So sustainable supply chain finance is one big area we can participate. Another is in infrastructure finance. If we are going to completely and holistically change the energy systems, especially in some of the developing markets today, which are in many cases 100% dependent on coal, we are going to need massive amounts of investment, billions and billions of dollars in renewables infrastructure, and also an entire system of a new way of delivering that energy through new grids. And at the same time, we're going to have to figure out how do we quickly get off or decommission coal in those same economies. So there we employ a different form of financial innovation, and that is the notion of generating carbon credits to help pay for some of the activities that we want to incent, whether they be natural capital solutions or something like early coal decommissionings. Innovating for Climate. An eco-sparity conversation continues in a moment. And now, back to Innovating for Climate, an eco-sparity conversation podcast produced by The Business Times, in partnership with Standard Chartered and Tomasic for eco-sparity. If we can sort of look forward to COP28, what do you think are one or two key climate action outcomes that you think this COP would be able to unlock or realize that could accelerate? So two areas that I would point to are, first, 
the concept of adaptation finance. We've talked a lot about carbon emissions reduction and financing that mitigation, but we equally have to recognize that no matter what we do and no matter how fast we do it, we are going to have to live with the realities of climate change. And that's going to require us to adapt. And that's going to require hundreds of billions of capital. And the sooner we put that capital to work, the quicker we avoid exponential loss and damage due to the effects of what we're seeing play out right now. We need to define what adaptation finance means, and then we need to create a framework in order for the financial system to begin to participate in this and think about it in a commercial way. We've got to deploy the capital toward adaptation finance. We know that if we can do that within the next decade, there will be a 12 times return in terms of loss and damage avoided if we deploy that capital quickly. The second topic is back to carbon markets. Today, the markets are highly fragmented. The pricing of carbon is quite wide. And when we talk about the what we say bid-ask spread. And part of that is that we need to have a system of standards that is globally adopted to give markets comfort, whether that be on the buy side or the sell side, to participate actively. We think that is an absolutely critical component of being able to finance that last mile of the hard-to-abate sectors. In the absence of those solutions, we need to find financial engineering to be able to provide that net zero outcome for people who've already committed. I'm most looking forward to an evening where we're going to be tasting new plant-based and alternative protein foods, actually, <laughs> if you can really, on a very personal level. So it's COP28. It's actually 31 years since the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was put in place. And every year we come, there's a build-up, especially if you're a young person looking at this and thinking, okay, this is it. This is where we save the world. And actually, no, it's not like that. And it's an imperfect process where countries come together with lots of other stakeholders and try and make progress. And then occasionally there's some breakthrough moments Well, you get that. And Marisa said this, funding for adaptation, funding for loss and damage, blended finance, where we use public money in a way that takes on more risk to get more private capital to flow into emerging markets. That's one of the places we need to see a real progress. The food system, I mean, we need to shift to a much more plant-rich diets in the world. And even if we have seaweed for cows, actually, that can do a little tiny slice of it. Really, it's the big shift to plant-rich that is a focus on this. Food's really on the agenda for the first time in a big way at this COP. And this is a situation where we need the entire world to play its part. If you're a leader in an institution or in a business, you've got a role to play. And I used the phrase before, the race of our lives. This is a race to decarbonize and to adapt and to see if we can actually bring climate change under control in the next few decades and end global warming. And it's a race for all of us. So COP's a moment for it. But if you're looking at COP this year, let's not think, oh, no, COP didn't save us again, because actually it's for all of us. The more influence you have, and obviously... Standard Charter's influential, Tamasek were influential, we have more responsibility, but it's on all of us to play our parts in this. Circling back to Earthshot, one of their principles is radical collaboration. And radical collaboration involves partnership amongst sometimes unnatural actors, the private and the public sector coming together in the form of blended finance, but in the form of agitation for a collective vision for what are the unlocks that we collectively have to apply our expertise and our intellect toward. Is it policy change? Is it some new tech solution? Is it a systems change model? I mean, all of these things are the things that we will be discussing deeply at COP. And they're calling this the year of private sector participation in COP because the original vision of COP was bringing together just governmental actors in policy making circles to try to deliver change. I think this idea now with this COP is public and private equally at the table to try to bring our collective expertise to this very, very complex subject of, of climate change and overall sustainability. Both of you, what are some areas of focus for you moving forward past COP and going into next year? Absolutely. So I think about it almost in two bookends. In, in one respect, it is scale sustainable finance, so do more of what's working well, more financing for infrastructure in the well-trodden paths of wind and solar and hydro, where we know it works. We just need more and more capital applied. And at the under the end of the spectrum is this innovation arena. And for us, we, we express that in four thematics, the monetization of carbon, adaptation finance, biodiversity, which is bringing natural capital solutions to the table, which sometimes are far more effective in climate change mitigation. They're often cheaper. And 
then they have co-benefits where they might feed the ecosystem. And then finally, our fourth key thematic is blended finance. Um, we deeply believe that there is a role to play in the same either capital stack or same project when you can bring public and private together. If public or concessionary capital providers and even philanthropists can take certain risks off the table, that allows me as a commercial actor to often play in a multiplier type of way to crowd in that extra capital that we need that will solve some of those areas that today we struggle to try to deploy capital at scale. Marisa, you mentioned carbon markets, and I think we agree as well. It's really hard to get to net zero without a high-functioning carbon market. And this is based on quality projects and real carbon. And as you said, it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card for people. This is about actually looking at how can we finance decarbonization super fast at scale. So with a platform we set up, Gen Zero, which is dedicated to helping finance those solutions that's only just over a year old. It, we launched it in, in June at EcoSperity in 2022. So working with the team at Gen Zero to look at how do we invest across that ecosystem from credible projects, from technology, nature-based solutions, carbon advisory firms, how do we make sure that works? But I think the radical collaboration phrase is important there. We need to lean in and actually make sure people are confident and understand that good carbon markets are the route to net zero and that we're going to fix this together and get confidence behind that. More money into the global south, into solutions there. And that's not been a traditional focus area for us in a big way, but partnering with firms such as Leapfrog, the impact investor. I'm really excited. We've been developing a climate strategy with them, which we'll roll out together with them in, in 2024, helping bring finance to the growth companies that can actually reach out to the poorest consumers there to bring them energy access, clean energy access, clean mobility access and things for the first time. Maybe I could just touch as we round out our, our discussion today on this radical collaboration point, because right here in Singapore, something that we're both working on together is uh, Tamasek and, and Standard Chartered and the MAS is an initiative to try to see if we can't create a credible framework for early coal decommissioning. So critically important in these markets when we talk about bringing in the global south, whether it's Indonesia or Vietnam under the JETPs, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, one of the unlocks to have the capital that's been committed by host governments and the private sector, which is a very large pool of capital, is dependent upon quickly getting off coal and investing in renewables. But somebody's got to pay for that decommissioning. And one of the most promising areas in that respect would be to create carbon credits from that early closure of those plants. And that's an initiative that we're working on in collaboration and in partnership right here, right now. Who knew a regulator or a government could participate with an early stage investor and a large bank all in the same pursuit of that common shared objective? The other thing, obviously, we've been working on for a couple of years together is climate impact exchange. Yes, yes. Standard Charter, Tamaset, with SGX and DBS involved. So really setting up a new regional carbon exchange, which is looking at first of the kind credits. So how do we have new projects coming through, but you have really high transparency That's about right. the standards that are used, the credibility behind it, so you can have high confidence in the carbon credits that you're buying. CIX is a fairly early but very promising initiative and that's been, I would say, it's a it's a blood, sweat and tears for all of us <laughs> uh, as, uh, as founding yeah. shareholders, but leaning in to help the team there set that up and deliver something. And I think we've all got to be prepared to form these novel partnerships, put sweat equity, reputational equity alongside financial equity involved in projects and take some risk on doing some things that are where success isn't guaranteed. And, and we're in the era where we really need to, to lean in and make sure we're fully present there together. Well, that's right. As a capital markets professional of 35 some odd years, what is very clear to me is that anytime you want to scale a market or an asset class, you need to create confidence. Take some risks, turn competitors or what traditionally are rivals into partners and have some great plant-based foods. Uh, there's so much going on and there's so much optimism and there's so much to look forward to. Thank you so much to the both of you for anchoring this really interesting session. Thanks, Keith. A pleasure. On behalf of Tomasek, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Marisa. And to our listeners on the podcast, thank you. 
This was a podcast produced by the Business Times in partnership with Standard Chartered and Tomasic for Ecosparity. Find more BT podcasts at businesstimes.com.sg slash podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts.